Welcome to worship here at Ebenezer, and we're glad that you could uh, join us either in person or online. If you would please stand as we begin our second Sunday of the Advent season. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we anticipate your return when you will set all things right and make all things new. In the meantime, Lord, just be with us to be your faithful witnesses, sharing the good news of Jesus through his first coming, that we might be saved from our sin and live everlasting with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
never know. Oh, trust and obey, for there's no 
be seated. Thank you for leading us in song. All right. When you hear the word king, what usually comes to mind? I heard that. Some think Jim King. Well, besides that, When we think of king, I usually think of someone of absolute authority, absolute power. I think of something, uh, another name I would attach sometimes to this idea of king is a dictator. But there always seems to be something about a king where it seems like they're always a bit nervous about staying in power, and they're always suspicious of other potential rivals. What is interesting to think of how the Bible describes a king, there's actually a a chapter in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 17, which told the people of Israel what their kings were to be like. And some of the descriptions are are, are pretty amazing when you think about your normal idea of a, a king. Biblical kings were to be different. In Deuteronomy 17, it says that Uh, They're only to uh, be uh, paid a certain, uh, a limited amount of money. They are to have a small military. They're not to have a cavalry with a bunch of horses. Their thinking is they're, they're never to think that they're better than those they serve. And they're also not to have many wives. Interesting description of what a king should be like, and most kings that we know are nothing like that. In fact, is when we think about the biblical kings, by the time we get to the third king of Israel, his name is Solomon, King Solomon, we find out in, by, by 1 Kings chapter 4 that King Solomon has not followed these directions given to kings in Deuteronomy 17. By the time Solomon is on this scene, He has 12,000 horses. Imagine that. He has 12,000 horses for his cavalry. He has uh, put some of his fellow Israelites into forced labor, like slaves. He also has all sorts of money, (laughs) which is an unbelievable amount of money that he had. And we also find out later that he had... uh, thousand uh, wives and we would say that's definitely not very smart but anyways uh yeah kings they they seem to uh when they when they get this idea of power this power goes to their head and to their heart and they want to be the ultimate authority well thinking of a of a of a king i like to turn to Luke chapter 2. So please turn with me to the gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 2. And here in Luke chapter 2, we are going to meet a king. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. This was the first census that took place Well, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Here we have Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus. And what helps us here is to get context. These first two verses give us an historical context to when Jesus was to be born. And here we see the Roman emperor at that time was Caesar Augustus. And here Caesar Augustus... Caesar Augustus was one who ruled Rome, ruled the Roman Empire for 45 years. And it's actually a golden age for Rome at that time. And uh, in a sense, uh, he, uh, at his deathbed, said, I received the, 
the, the, the city of Rome as clay, but I've made it into marble. Uh, there was prosperity for the people, and really the Roman world at that time, other than some tribes up in Germany, uh, was known for its peace, which was a good thing, because eventually, because the Roman Empire was a peaceful, it was a peaceful time period, is the gospel could go forth. And the Romans were great at building roads throughout the roads throughout the empire, and the and missionaries could travel these roads and and share the good news of Jesus with others. So this is the kind of emperor he was, Caesar Augustus. Fact is, he was so popular. Our month of August is named after him. That's the reason why we have a month called August, because of Caesar Augustus. So this we find out here, you know, going back to the the scripture is. He issues a decree, he's, a, he's, he's king, he's emperor, he can do what he wants, and so he issues a decree that there should be a census takes place. They want to, he wants to get a head count of how many people are in his empire, and he also wants to do something else, he wants to make sure that uh, his empire is getting some revenue through some taxes. So here he is, he's saying that everybody has to go back to their, and we'll find out that their hometown um, and be counted and also pay tax. And so we go to this next part, verses 3 through 5, and we get a little bit more specific of what happens to a, a couple. And it goes at verse 3, And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So here we see that there is this couple who lives in the northern part of Israel in Nazareth. And because David is of the family, or excuse me, Joseph is the, the family of David, he has to travel to Bethlehem and to register, to be counted for the census, and to pay tax. Going from Nazareth, going up in the north, going south towards Bethlehem, would be geographically they're going up. The geography of the land is it goes, and it's going up in elevation. So Mary and Joseph are traveling up. And why? Because they're going to the house because he's of the, the family of David. And this makes a really good connection for us to know all of Scripture, because in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord told King David, who wanted to build him a house, a temple, the Lord said, no, you're not going to build the temple. Your son Solomon will do that. But I'm going to give you a house, in a sense saying a kingdom, that will last forever. And so here we get the, the, the hint that something more is going on here than just Caesar Augustus making this decree that everybody has to go register in their hometown and pay tax is the Lord is the one who's really orchestrating all of this to happen. Because here is Joseph and his pregnant wife traveling to Bethlehem because he's of the family of David. And this is going to be this pregnancy that this, this woman, Mary, who's pregnant, is going to carry this special child by the name of Jesus, and he is going to establish this kingdom that was promised hundreds of years ago to David. So Joseph and Mary, they travel up, they up uphill, especially when they would have gotten to Jericho, and before they would, would get to to Bethlehem, it would be an uphill hike of 3,500 feet. And to imagine that traveling to Bethlehem, which literally, the, the word in the Hebrew, Bethlehem, means house of bread. That's interesting. It's called the house of bread. Because late in the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, this was our theme verse for our missionary conference this year, is Jesus said that he is what? He is the bread of life. And here the bread of life 
was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. So traveling from Nazareth in the northern part of Galilee, down south, going uphill to Bethlehem, is about a journey of 90 miles. 90 miles. You don't have a plane, you don't have a car, you're walking. You're walking. So here's Mary, pregnant, about ready to have child, walking with Joseph, heading towards Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a small village about seven miles southwest of Jerusalem. If Joseph and Mary were able to walk 20 miles a day, and I'm not sure that they would have been able to do so, this was a journey that probably took about seven days. About seven days to get to Bethlehem. And once they arrived, what happens? What happens next? Look at verses 6 and 7 of Luke chapter 2. And while they were there, there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So here they arrive to Bethlehem. And because so many pilgrims are making this journey back to their their hometown to be registered. There's a lot of people there. And there's places are full of, you know, it's not like they have a Holiday Inn or a Comfort Inn or a Fairfield Inn. They just don't have those. They were, they ended up having, the space was limited. And they found this place where the animals were at. And there was this feeding trough or manger because there was no crib for his bed, that Jesus could be placed in this manger. This manger for his bed. Because there was no room for them in the inn. And so we see this very humbling. This, the whole, does it, is not this whole scene paint a picture of humility? Having you know, a, a pregnant woman leaving with her husband, traveling by foot on this difficult journey, going to a place that is not their home, Nazareth is their home, and then having the baby, not in a house, not in a home, but in a place where the animals were at, because there was a feeding trough, a manger there, a picture of humility. And I really believe that Luke... The writer of this gospel, he is, he's making a contrast for us between two kings. Between two kings. We have Caesar Augustus, empire, you know, the emperor of the Roman Empire, who has the authority and the power to say, you need to go register. I need to take a census. You've got to go to the place that you were born. Men, you've got to go to that place you were born. Yeah, that'd be no problem for me, Jim King. I was born in Bluffton, Ohio, a few minutes after midnight on November 12, 1953, when President Eisenhower was the President of the United States of America. It'd be no problem for me to register in my hometown because I still live in my home, hometown. But not the case. Here for this couple, Joseph and Mary. They travel, they make this trip, this, in a way, very almost humiliating trip because she's pregnant, ready to have a child. And so I think Luke does not want us to miss the contrast between that king, King Caesar Augustus, and Jesus, the servant king. And we know he's a king because remember in Luke chapter 1, When the angel Gabriel told Mary, the Virgin Mary, and said, you will be with child, what did that angel say? Look at it. In in chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, as the angel describes Jesus, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give them the throne of his father, 
David. Once again, going back to 2 Samuel 7, the promise that God made to David. So this Jesus is, is a king. And it says, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. Here we have Caesar Augustus being contrasted with this king, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the king of kings and lord of lords. And in humility is placed in a feeding trough where the animals are kept. Cannot miss this contrast that the gospel writer is making. But we also know this about Bethlehem, and it's a very important aspect of Bethlehem, and we'll talk more about this next week, next Sunday. But Bethlehem is a place where sheep and lambs were raised. Those sheep were raised there because the temple in Jerusalem, remember again that Bethlehem is only seven miles from Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem is the Jewish temple, the center of Jewish religion. And there, sacrifices needed to be made. And so sheep and lambs were required for sacrifice. And so there were shepherds abiding in the field. They're raising sheep. Raising sheep for the sacrifices that were needed in Jerusalem. But there was Jesus, and there, you can't miss this, not only is Bethlehem in the Hebrew called house of bread, we also know that Bethlehem was the place that lambs were raised to be sacrificed during Passover. And here Jesus, who the scriptures describes as who? The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, born in Bethlehem and placed in a manger. He was virgin born. By being virgin born, he was not tainted with a sin nature like we humans. We are sinners by nature. We're born as sinners. Jesus was unique. He was the God-man. He was God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Bethlehem, where sheep were raised for the Jewish temple in Jerusalem to be sacrificed. And here, the Lamb of God placed in the manger, foretelling the sacrifice that he would make as the servant king. Jesus would be the ultimate sacrificial lamb. And there is a a, a song by by Chris Tomlin called You Are My King. And I love this part of the lyrics where it says, Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, referring to Jesus, should die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Again, this is the contrast. We see it between Caesar Augustus and Jesus. Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor who formed an imperial guard. It's sort of like our secret service today. Except this imperial guard had at least, at the, at the minimum, 5,000 Roman soldiers just to protect Caesar Augustus from harm. 5,000 soldiers and their whole strict purpose, well, they did other, other tasks and other jobs, but it was to protect the Roman emperor. Caesar Augustus was the first one to initiate this group, this imperial guard. He wanted to save his life, protect his life, But what did Jesus do? He gave his life. And as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amazing love, how can it be that my king should die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. For my sake, for your sake, he became sin that we might have the righteousness of God placed upon us and be able to stand before his throne. So when I think of this manger, when I think of Jesus' birth at Bethlehem, where here is already a picture of a a king and his humility that he is going to be willing to die 
He's willing to die for us, his subjects, this king of kings and lord of lords, sacrifices himself for us. And then I think of what would our response be? What should our response be? And I think during Advent, what, is it, what, what would it look like for me in, in humility to, to lose my life during Advent? To experience this costly humility like Jesus. And just like that, that, that song I had quoted, that, that last line of that, those lyrics, I said, it's, it's my joy to honor you. It's my joy to honor you. And it, it reminds me of that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.15. It's on the screen for you. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. See, this is the change that Jesus makes in us. When we come to Jesus, when we receive Jesus as that free gift of grace, our hearts are changed. Because our own sinful human nature is we're so consumed with self. And here it says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. It's my joy to honor you. The Lord forms within us, because of our relationship with him, a manger lifestyle. That we're willing to live out a costly humility and not live for selves, but live for Jesus. To love God and to love others. So during Advent, I think of what are some ways that I can lose my life during this time of the year. Well, let me give you three ways. One of them, during this season of giving, how to lose your life during Advent is give an ear. Listen more, speak less. And it's a lot harder than you think. It's a lot, it's difficult at times to be an active listener. We so much, our human nature, we want to elevate ourselves. We want to make ourselves look better than those around us. But Jesus changes our hearts. And maybe this Advent season is a good time to give an ear. It's really a precious gift when somebody is willing to listen to you. Someone who puts the cell phone down, that has eye contact with you, that leans in. And maybe ask some good questions, because they want to hear your heart. And boy, this is a a time where we need to hear each other's hearts. Questions like, what's been the most challenging for you this holiday season? What are you looking forward to? To maintain eye contact, to have active listening, to really lean in and hear what others have to say. What a precious gift we can give. And we can start with our families. Start with those under our own roof. Also during this season of giving is think of, again, lose your life during Advent is to uh, give some time. And that might be a a bit tricky now with COVID, you know, our interaction with, with others and that. But to think about how can we serve those who are in the margins? And again, because of COVID, there might be certain restrictions where you cannot help and maybe a soup kitchen or whatever, but you might want to find out. See what it takes to serve those in the margins. And I had mentioned this before, too, that there can be those times where you're going to see maybe some more homeless out along the exits of the highways and maybe have a blessing bag ready to give. A way to, you know, rather than giving money or like just looking through, I don't want, I don't want to make eye contact. Hurry up, traffic light changed to green. I don't want to have to look at this person. Oh, I have, I have a blessing bag. Now, what they do with the blessing bag, guess what? That's on them. It's not on you. Again, a way to lose our lives during Advent. And then also to think about giving gifts. And, and, and typically, during the time of Christmas, we give gifts to those who we're also going to receive a gift from, oftentimes. But I'm talking about giving gifts that there's really no, like, you receiving back other than the blessing of giving. 
And again, just as a reminder, that in the back of our Crossroads Ministry Center, we have these two possibilities of helping out uh, Mission Possible and their work in Haiti, and also helping the Door of Faith Orphanage in Mexico. There's ways that we can help by giving what I call agape Christmas gifts. Those are gifts given where there's nothing expected in return. These are ways in which we can come to Jesus and because of our relationship with him, he changes our hearts. He changes our focus. He changes what we do where we lose our life for him during Advent. And again, I go back to that song. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, should die for me Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for how you are the one who was in control of the decree that Caesar Augustus made so long ago. That by your hand... Joseph and a pregnant Mary made a trip to Bethlehem, the house of bread, the place where lambs were born and raised and bred the sacrifices in the temple. And then we know that that Jesus, the Lamb of God, our ultimate sacrifice, his life for our life, that we might be free from sin and live eternally with you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, Jesus, should die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. Help me, Lord, to respond in joy to honor you. Amen. Let's stand and go ahead and sing Amazing Love together. Coming from a heart of gratitude, humility, and thankfulness, let's sing together.
I do. In all I do, I honor you. Let's pray. Lord, we can scarce take it in, this amazing love that you have, giving us to, your, to us as a gift, your son, to think that you, my king, should die for me. This is amazing love. And Lord, help us to know that it is true in our hearts. And because it's true in our hearts, Lord, it changes our hearts. And so we go forth to honor you in joy. So thank you, Lord, for your word today and how it speaks to us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.